Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. Welcome back, my friends, to another episode of the Shema Podcast. And I have a an amazing guest with me today, David Block, who is a fellow Torch podcast listener. And he reached out and he wanted to experience Shabbos in a community. So I helped sort of coordinate him coming out and coming into town from Huntsville, Alabama last Friday. And he, he spent the Shabbos with us and it's now Labor Day on Monday, and we're sitting in the beautiful Torch Center as it's getting prepared for Rabbi Yochoff Wolby's daughter's bat mitzvah, and we decided to sit down and record an episode. There was a lot of the conversations we have had were on topics I think are relevant to all of us, whether you are someone who is a Torah observant Jew or a secular Jew or a reformed Jew. It's a conversation that we should all be participating in. So, David, thank you so much for sitting down and doing an episode with me. You're very welcome. I'm glad to be here. All right, fantastic. So, there's a lot of people listening who have never experienced Shabbos in a Torah observant community. No phones for 25 hours, no driving in a car. You know, like no Alabama football. No Alabama football, which, <laughs> which was, was a big deal. Which for was you. a big deal for me, yes, sir. So I'm from Alabama. Grew up in Tuscaloosa at a Reform temple that was, you know, we were we were active, and my family was active, but I didn't really get Torah background, and I uh, had never done I'd never done the Torah observant Shabbos. And I reached out to you and, and asked you if, if you would help me do that. And so I came here, and it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. I kind of had this feeling that it would be a little bit like Yum Kipper, you know, where there's just a bunch of no's, you know, like, and like, <laughs> like, can't do this, can't do that. And I never felt any of those restrictions. It was all just positive, you know, going to, going to the different services, eating the meals, seeing the people in the community, it was really wonderful. Yeah, Rabbi Ari explained to me early on, it's like every week going on a cruise. When you turn off your computer and your phone and those attachments, those anchors to the mundane week, you know, and just you and your family, your home that's been transformed from a normal weekday home to a you now a Shabbos home, like a, a ship sending out, although with a community, you're with an entire community, it's there's a different feel, is it not, when Shabbos sets in? No doubt. And, and walking through the neighborhood during, during different parts of the day and seeing the families walking, everybody's out walking, you know, there's not cars screaming by. It was, it was really meaningful and, and moving to see how family-oriented it was. You know, to, to study and to pray in a, in a traditional shul was, was a new experience for me. As, as you know, I mean, I was... I was lost, <laughs> but like I told you, I mean, I was, I'm, I'm comfortable being lost because that's, that's where I am right now in my journey. And, and, and I'm just happy to be in a shul uh, where people are observing and, and praying in, in a, in a traditional way. And I figure I'll catch up at some point. Right. I think the whole idea too, that even, you know, as my learning has progressed, if you, if one would ever find their Yiddishkeit, their practice of serving Hashem, Becoming so comfortable that becomes rote, that's the problem. Mm. Like you, we should all be pushing ourselves into places of being uncomfortable because that's where growth occurs. Right. right. And I think really, I think what you've seen here is everyone here is constantly pushing themselves into places of being uncomfortable. It's just different than where we're holding maybe right now. Right. And, and I know I've talked to you about this one-on-one, but, but going to, to a shul for traditional service, it, I mean, it was really, it's given me chills to think about it, but it was not only beautiful from me saying my prayers during the service for that day, but it almost took me back in time, you know, uh, just because it, it has to be like what, what, what 
praying at shul was like, you know, back in the 1800s or or whatever. And it, it's just right. a it's just an amazing feeling to as little as I know, I know enough to know that this is a part of a great tradition that goes back thousands of years and it's beautiful and any part I can play or participate in it makes your soul feel good. It really does. Yeah, you know, the the sitter we follow was created by the men of the Great Assembly after the Second Temple. They had prophecy. They were about to end prophecy and because they wanted to remove idolatry and to remove something on one side means moving something on the other side of the extreme. So they wanted to prepare us. And that's why the, the words in the sitter, like every letter was perfectly chosen because there's deep Kabbalistic things happening there. But if you look, if you notice what's different between going to a Torah observant shul versus like what I grew up with, like you with, with reform or going to my you know, conservative synagogues, is that there was no leadership. What you saw was that just a bunch of guys show up. One guy says, I'll be Kazan today. Right. Right. And then he got up and sort of led to keep us in pace to be at like certain points like Shimon Esri at time. But the, the next night, someone else got up and it was just a bunch of people. Wasn't like, you know, it was like you, you go in there and it's like, okay, cue the chorus, cue the, the cantor. Right. Right. You know, right. No, like, no. And, we just and show up and we worship Hashem. Just, just to drill down on that, you know, growing up in a reform congregation, you know, there's a rabbi who, in all, in all intents and purposes, is the clergy. And, you know, he's the leader. He or she, I guess, is the leader. And I never really knew that there was a difference. I, that's just what I grew up with. But, right. but now having seen what you're talking about, the, t- the sort of the everyone's equal, everyone's part of the service, you know, it, it, it does make it seem like a quote unquote normal reform service. You kind of relegate it to the audience, sort of, it, in a sense. Right. It becomes a passive experience because that's why I grew up with too. And I actually, my first experience at a uh, Orthodox show was I decided my flight got delayed till a Saturday in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And my hotel was near a Chabad. And I had heard a bunch of really great Chabad lectures uh, online. I was like, I'll go. And I thought I would be sitting there in a chair. Mm-hmm. And then the Chabad rabbi would get up and say some prayers and then give some great, insightful Torah lecture. But what I encountered is what you encountered Friday night, where it's just like they handed me a sitter. And it's like, no, 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 no. This is a participatory sport here. Right. We're all involved. And I had no idea what was going on. But they helped me out. But there, there's also so much enthusiasm in the service, which which was neat, you know, and, and it, it, it just builds a spirit of you're so proud to be Jewish. You're so proud to be praying to God and and to, and, and learning how to how to how to do so in a way that people have been doing for hundreds of years. It's just it's it's really it's an exciting experience. And I don't know and I don't, I don't mean to talk you know, badly about other uh, services, but, you know, there are times in other services where I've felt moved from the sermon or I personally, you know, was really into the prayers that day or whatever. But this is like you, you come away feeling proud, like, like like you're carrying a flag and you're really like you were saying, you're, you're, you're not you're part of the leadership group. You're, you're, you're one of the leaders of the, of, of the program. And, and that just, it really, it, it's empowering. Yeah, I think that, you know, what is creating all that enthusiasm that happens every era of Shabbos because they are so thankful that Hashem gave us Shabbos and gave us an opportunity where through this observance of all these mitzvot that it, it allows us to leave the worldly, mundane activities and, and become on an elevator close to Hashem. That excitement, that enthusiasm is what they bring every single Friday. And you notice like people bring their young kids. Their kids are, you know, running around. Absolutely. Someone's there giving them candy and they grow up seeing this enthusiasm for Shabbos. Yeah. It was it was really powerful. And and the, like you said, there were there were young children running around but there were also I, I i don't know exactly how old but maybe somewhere in between somewhere around bar mitzvah age you know either right before or right after and they're actively taking part you know in the in the in the services i noticed that that they are kind of responsible for setting things up the young kids are into it and, and i can tell i've had 
I've raised kids. <laughs> and usually if you tell somebody, hey, I need you to go do something, you get, you know, whatever, there's some resistance. They were all doing it out of love and, and enjoying it. And, right. um, and that was neat to see. Especially when you see the freshly minted bar mitzvah boys lead and act as chazan for Micha, like you saw. I did. I saw that. Yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. And they're also proud and, and, and they love it. And it's, and that also makes you feel good because you know that there's another generation coming behind that will, that will carry the torch. Right. Exactly. Pun intended. It, exactly. We sit in the torch center. So one of the things I know we were discussing and I've heard from family members a lot too, was this claim that there is sexism in Orthodox Judaism. And the reason have pointed out to me is because we don't sit with our spouses in shul while we're praying. I think the biggest misunderstanding is the different format of what's taking place because, you know, when I would go to a service, like we were describing a form synagogue, I would sit with my wife and you're, it's passive, right? It's, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you saw like, even like, especially like praying shakaris in the morning, we're spending 20 minutes just reading prayers to make us realize that everything in our possession, every thought, everything we ever accomplished, it all came from Hashem. All there is is Hashem. He is animating us alive in this moment. We have no independence, and the fact that we think we have independence in all those moments is an illusion. So we're spending 20 minutes in the silent prayers, reading all these Psalms from King David, everything, getting up to Shema, getting ourselves in this mindset that everything is Hashem, so that when we step into Shimon Esrei, we will do so with recognition that, wow, we are standing in the presence of our Creator, and He is listening to every one of my words. That takes a lot of deep, quiet contemplation. And I think that's what's the misunderstanding is, is obviously we don't want the most important person in our life, our wife, and she doesn't want me sitting next to her when she's davening because we're, there's so much mental effort going into getting that space to connect with our Creator that it wouldn't do anything except distract us. And that's why they're in a different section doing the same thing. Hashem just says, don't make me compete for your attention with your amazing, beautiful wife, right? Right, right. Don't, don't, just give me your attention right now. And I think that's the, what they're not understanding is there's nothing sexist. Or we put our wives on such a high level that Hashem says, you put them on such a high level have them sit somewhere else so you can focus just on me. I think that's the the misinterpretation of what's happening. Right. And 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 because the the prayer services are are, are set at different times of the day, the the women, if I understand right, don't have to be there to begin with. Is it, is it right? Right. They don't have the, the time bound mitzvot, so they they dive in for sure. I could uh at Heimish uh, come, but you know, sometimes if they have young children, they'll Dobbin at home. Right. So it varies. And I think that's another idea too that it's it's a really beautiful idea that gets misconstrued is that there's different mitzvos for men and there's different mitzvos for women. And in the secular world it's like, oh well, you know, are you saying a woman can't do this job or a man can't do this job? And the the reality is is that, you know, the the way the Torah, Hashem is describing the creation is that all mankind all originate in the same source, like branches in a tree. And you got the 70 main branches of the nation's land. One of them is the branch from Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yokov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And from that branch comes every Jewish neshama. And so we're basically like limbs on the same body. And when you get down to our relationship with our wife, they are, that's our other half. So I don't know about you, David, but I'm horrible at multitasking, <laughs> like trying to like, Listening to something online while trying to return an email doesn't happen. Something's not getting done right, right? So somewhere out in podcast world, my wife is laughing right now. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. It doesn't work. However, what Hashem did by causing us to have a spouse or another half is he gave us a way to multitask. Because when my wife on Arab Shabbos, she's at home lighting the Shabbos candles. She's doing a mitzvah for both of us. That's my mitzvah too. And when I'm at shul saying those prayers to bring in Shabbos, that's her mitzvah too. So we're basically like two, a right arm and a left arm, each doing different mitzvahs separately, but they're both ours because we're one entity. And I think that's a beautiful idea and a whole different way of looking at marriage 
that you're one entity versus two entities that are supposed to be doing the same thing, I think that would benefit a lot of marriages to understand that reality. No, no doubt. And, you know, I've learned in my journey on trying to learn more about, about Judaism that, that women are actually, I may say this wrong, but they're a higher level being. They are closer to Hashem because they can give life. You know, they can birth children. We, we can't. And, and so it's not what, 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 what people look from the outside in and think is, is sexist. It's really the opposite of sexism in, or, or in the sense that it's really not, it's not f- favoring women. It's just realizing that women have a closer connection to God. Right. They don't have to do all the things that we heathen men have to do right. to get close to God. They can just be close to God you know, they just have a closer connection to God because of their ability to give life. And, and they were created last. They were the most recent creation. And so I do think that that's something that that's unfair, that people that, that grew up like me, not traditional, have this view of, of Torah observant Judaism being sexist. It's having immersed myself in it for a weekend, women are equal partners and they're taking care of of business during the the weekend and and really are put on a pedestal if anything else yeah. uh it's it's amazing yeah that's that's all i've experienced too and yeah like you said if there's any difference in stature hashim is saying i made man men deficient which is why if you want to connect to me the way a woman does you got to strap on to fill in in order to wire your heart and mind to me you have to make sure you set time to dive into me three times a day because you, your mind, will stop thinking about me. A woman, I built her to do the opposite. And there's a whole reason and rationale why he built us differently like this. But yeah, I think if anything that Hashem is saying, and when we say, you know, those of us who believe that what the Torah is saying is true, that it came from Hashem and every word's divine, then when we say Torah says, we are saying the Creator said. And as a man, I accept it. Fine, you made me deficient, but you also gave me tefillin. Right. And seat seats, you know, and, and all the, the instructions on how to get myself to my wife's level of connection. You know, there's there's definitely, I mean, you and I grew up the same. There's a lot of misunderstanding. And I thought maybe we could tackle that. You know, I've, I've been sort of gone from living in the secular and reform world and now living in a, in a tour observant community. You sort of got... You're on both sides of the fence. You're living in both worlds. You know, you're interacting with us. You have uh, all your so many dear friends at your reform shul in Alabama. What are some other things you think are misunderstood? I've, I've thought about this a lot, Dan, and, and we've had some conversations about it. But one of the things I think, and I'll just be candid, for someone who is assimilated into, uh, you know, American culture or Western culture, some of the the clothing, the social norms of Torah observant Jews just seems weird or scary, you know, and uh, to somebody that's not in that world. And, you know, seeing Hasidic Jews with with what they wear and not being able to, you know, we're huggers in the I'm in the South. I'm a hugger. And, you know, you can't hug, you know, somebody, uh, you know, you can't hug somebody's wife, even if you're just friends with them. And that that kind of difference really causes some people to recoil, you know, like like what's wrong with you or what's wrong with me that you won't let me hug you. And it obviously it comes from a place of just not understanding the reasons why. But that is something that people feel uncomfortable with. Right. Because it's such a, it's like, why don't you want to have the warmth of giving you a hug? And it, that totally makes sense. Right. Right. Totally makes sense. And no, and, and obviously the, you know, the, the answer is, is that I think this became very clear during the hashtag me too. Mm. Yeah. You know, that what Hashem is telling us is like, create boundaries, build fences, protect your relationship and protect relationship with women who are not, you know, so you would never, if, if those people where they're accused, rightly so, are falsely accused, would have never found themselves in that situation if they followed our halakha right. on how to create fences around relationships you have with your wife versus with other women or m- women with men, right? So there's a, there's a deep rationale to it. And, 
And to be able to tell your spouse that, you know, you're the only person I hug finds meaningful to me. And I think once it's understood, you, there's, there's ways people convey warmth. It doesn't have to be physical. Like you've been around Zahav Wolby, Rabbi Ari's wife, Chaya Wolby, Rabbi Yokov Wolby's wife. They're great. Never hugged either of them. Right. It's just nothing but warmth. Right. So, but the, the, the dress is, that always, you know, was strange. Like, you know, is there no clothing stores in your community that where they don't sell anything other than black suits and white shirts? Like, you know, right, right. What, what's going on here? But so that was one of my early questions, you know, and what, what about Rabbi Yokoff? What we explained to me was, which is such a beautiful idea, I mean, especially today. He said, we are not trying to see people's clothing. A lot of people try to express their individuality with their clothing, right? Or if you go to a gym these days, they express what makes them special individual by how fit their body is, right? Clothing, the body, clothing, just different layers of clothing. We want to see people who they really are, their neshama, their heavenly neshama, experiencing this world in a body that has clothing on it. We're trying to remove the individuality of the clothing and see the actual person, which is a very beautiful idea. Now, doesn't mean I'm going to throw out my wardrobe and just say black suits and white shirts. Although I do love the idea too, like Steve Jobs and right. Einstein, where it's right. like, you don't have to think about what you're going to wear that day. Right. You know, it's just like, it's the same thing. I do, I am attracted to that idea, but I am always sort of, I think I'll always be sort of a, it's in the week, a jeans guy. <laughs> well, you know, and the more I thought about it and being here this weekend has helped, you know, I was in several shuls for several different services and saw you know, all kinds of people that wore the traditional garb and some that were wearing, you know, other stuff too. Right. But the, the, what, what struck me was, you know, they weren't judging me for what, I, for what I was wearing. They made me feel very welcome to be there and, and, and grateful for me to be there and happy to pray with me. And it's like, if they can be understanding of what I'm wearing. I sure ought to be able to be understanding of what they're wearing. Yeah. I find that the whole idea that they may be judgmental, that that was me. Uh, I forget what the, what's the psychological word where you take what's actually going Projection. On. Yeah. That was me projecting onto them because the one thing I've seen since, you know, I started going there and then when I lived there and I've just watched how they interact with people, people who grew up in a Torah observant world, knowing how difficult to know all the halakha around Shabbos and kosher and all the way in which we live. When they see someone from the outside, like you, wanting to learn and do that, they are in awe. Hmm. They've told me all the time, like, we can't believe that, that you are desiring to all, with all this life change. It's like, that's inspiring to me is what they tell me. When they see you show up, it's inspiring. They know how it's awkward. You've never done that praying before. The fact that you're there and you're cool with that, they find that inspiring. And so we're like, we were talking about this whole idea of why Hashem, like these last parshas we've been reading says, I'm sending you out in exile. Hashem is saying through Moses, like, by the way, you're all going to mess up. It's all going to go down. It's like the last words of the Torah. I'm going to send you out in exile. What's going to happen out in exile? It's really what's going to make the next revelation permanent. And so, because now what's happening is you have people that have been learning Torah from parent to child forever. You got people like us that come in fresh, and it's creating an energy, and we're all feeding off each other. And you can see it part of Hashem's overall plan here. Absolutely. And on the point of judgmentalism, it, it, that's one of the things that I grew up sort of hearing, you know, about Orthodox Judaism or Hasidic Judaism is that the people in those movements are, are judgmental of me and don't think I'm a real Jew and think I'm going to go to hell for not keeping all the commandments. And I can honestly say that being here this weekend at, you know, the different shuls that we went to and with the torch rabbis and also going to other observant congregations and Chabad and, and others that I've, that I've been to, I have never experienced judgmentalism out of any Torah observant Jew. They're just glad somebody's interested, and they'll, and they'll just go on and on. You know, I'll tell them, oh, I, I listened to a, a podcast about such and such, and they'll, and they'll look at me like, oh, my gosh, that's incredible, you know, that you listen to a podcast about mitzvahs. That's, that's un, unreal. And so 
I, I'm just comfortable being around people that realize, you know, that I'm different and, appre- and appreciate that, appreciate that I'm different and are willing to, to share with me their knowledge. And, and that's, that's a, been an, an incredible thing to experience. Point is that they know from studying Torah is that everyone comes in this world and they have different circumstances and challenges. So that's why there's no judgment. And when they see someone who was brought up with no knowledge of Torah and mitzvot and how to do it, even making the smallest steps, they like, they're wondering, like, could, could I have done that? So that's why there is a symbiotic relationship where we're coming to them to teach us and give us wisdom. We're also, I think, bringing a youthful enthusiasm towards what we're doing. And everyone has a struggle in front of them. But yeah, I think the whole idea of being judgmental, I have never, ever experienced that from anyone. I just think that's flat. That's just a flat wrong misconception that people have of, of Torah observant Jews. And I think another thing that people get confused about is that don't grow up Torah observant is they think that there's all these laws, there's 613 laws, and they're all, nobody can ever remember it all. And it's just so much, and it's so in-depth, and it's so detailed. We're going to always set up for failure. That's part of it, what God wants. You know, Yes, he gives us laws to follow, but he knows we're going to fall short. And when we fall short, we say we're sorry, and we'll try to do better, and we honestly try to do better, and he accepts us with open arms. Right. So let's talk about the, the whole thing with the, the relationship with God, because that's really what this is all about. It's what life's all about. It's why God created the world is to create an environment where you could have a relationship with him. And yeah, it does seem like, why did God create all these different mitzvot? Are they just some arbitrary stuff where you can sit back and say, you know, I didn't say Simon says. Exactly. Sorry. You're in trouble. Yeah. You know, pay attention next time, Dan. Back to the line, get him on fire, you know, so it's not the idea. You know, what he's trying to give us is something so amazingly beautiful. And yes, there's a lot of the mitzvot, and the vast majority of them really, I would say on a level, we don't quite understand because our eyes and our sensory perception is limited to our physical bodies by design. Our bodies do not give us sensory perception. Our bodies conceal our sensory perception of what's really happening in the world. Part of it in a relationship is doing what the other wants when you don't understand it. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes my wife asks me to do things I don't understand. And there's times where I say, you need to explain it to me. And there's some times where I just say, I'll do that, of course, because I love you. Which of those times is more meaningful to my wife? When we just say, it's important to you, it's important to me. And that's a big part of this. In the end, what he's, he's trying to give us is he's trying to forge us and create a system to forge us and to be in his image. You know, that's the whole idea of Olam Abba, is to create us to an image that we can be in his presence and not be ashamed. You just mentioned a word that if I've learned anything, especially in the last probably year or two, but if I've learned anything about Torah observant Judaism, it's that God wants a relationship with us. And the way that we have a relationship with him is by doing the things that he wants us to do and not doing the things that he doesn't want us to do. But if we do the things that he wants us to do, we are creating on earth the kind of world that he wants and the kind of world that exists in heaven now. And so it's treating each other well, you know, it's taking care of each other. It's, it's recognizing the strengths and and beauty in, in all different parts of our society. And, but it's, the idea of a relationship that I didn't understand was in Judaism when I was growing up in Reform Judaism. I didn't know that I could have a personal relationship with God and have a personal dialogue with God. My experience growing up Reform, I don't know if it was similar with you, but there were just certain things like we don't do that, quote unquote. That's that's a that's a Christian thing, you know. Saying things like I need to have a relationship with my Lord and Savior. That that was seen as that's a Christian thing. God in our world is more distant, more unknowable, unfathomable. I mean, God is unfathomable, but what he's revealed to us is that he wants a relationship with us. And the Torah, the Bible, tells us what we're supposed to do to have that relationship with him. That's what I saw too growing up, 
there was it was nothing about God. It was more about Jewish customs and lifestyles in the year. And when I started learning, it's like that's how far away that's moved because it's it's all about a relationship with our Creator. That's the entire reason we're here. That's why the first thing He says during the National Revelation at Mount Sinai, they made sure that all the Jewish people heard the first two. One was, I am not Shem your God, like we say in the small, that took you out of the land of Egypt to be a God to you. He didn't say, I am Hashem your God who created space and time and all the physicality in the universe and the heavenly realm, and I created the entire system. He didn't say that. He said, I'm Hashem your God who took you out of the land of Egypt because I want a relationship with you. I never learned growing up that God created the world to have a relationship with us so that we could do commandments to bring holiness into this world such that an aspect of God could dwell with us. And, you know, that's just beautiful. And here's something else interesting is, I mean, my experience, you know, speak to a lot of my friends and loved ones, family, I find them going elsewhere for spirituality. Like, well, for spirituality, I, I do yoga and meditation. And it's like, then what do you go to your synagogue for? It's like, you know, to see my friends and, it's like that's a cultural thing, and then my spirituality is coming from somewhere else, which that's not right. Like we have the system for spirituality. That, that is so true. You know, if you don't believe in God, <laughs> that you don't believe in anything, you're going to go believe in something else. You're going to elevate something else to the level of a God and, and worship it, whether it be money or fame or whatever. God made the Jewish people— stiff-necked <laughs> and part of being stiff-necked is what makes us so when something ignites our our spirit we become obsessed with it and become warriors for it and right. so some jews have because they're not part of towards observant judaism they replace that spark with social movements or, or environmentalism or, or or whatever and they become passionate about that right. the same level that the people that are connected through torah they they w- it, it's being channeled it's basically like this energy it's like it was the commentary on the parsha i can't remember which verse but it was saying like what the verse meant was that hashem made us to go in extremes right, right? and that because uh, everything has to have a counterbalance what torah is giving us is a way to channel all that energy if it's not channeled you have a call marks right exactly you know? You always see a Jew behind, I want to change the world. Exactly. Yeah, so it's like the Torah gives us the framework for channeling that energy. I think another big question is when people say about talking about God is you have to define God. It's a very big question because what I saw was, like what you described, was that there's a God who created the world and left it alone, which is what Pharaoh said. You know, when Pharaoh was speaking with Joseph, and Joseph said, don't give me credit for interpreting these dreams. It all came from God. Pharaoh knew that God. Mm. When Moses came and used the name Yudke Vavke, that Pharaoh said, I don't, I don't I don't know this God. What does that name represent? The God that's intimately involved in all the man's affairs. And why did it harden his heart? Because the idea that all Pharaoh's success and all the richness and prosperity of Egypt was not his own, that hardened his heart. The idea that he, that he would have to say that Hashem did it all, not him. So, and that's why we say in the Shema first line, that those two aspects of God are one, the one that created everything and the one that is intimately involved in our lives. And which one does Hashem want us to focus on? The one that's intimately involved in our lives, the one that took us out of Egypt because he loves us. Absolutely. So there's another idea. Jewish people, we don't want to become arrogant and say, oh, I'm a Jew, I'm better than you. The guilt around chosen people. That's right. And, you know, one of the things that, that I've come across with people that I've grown up with in, in Reform Judaism is there's a tendency to, look, there's a lot of unexplainable things about our world and our lives, and, and there's a lot of tragedy and a lot of unjust suffering. And, you know, and people, people want to say, I can't believe in a God or that would allow that to happen. And, of course, that's understandable, you know, an understandable sentiment. But we should always be striving to understand what's going on and understand why we're here and what the meaning of, of life is. And, and if we're just going to say, 
oh, I can't believe in a God that would allow the Holocaust to happen, which is what I've heard a thousand yeah. times, you know, and just give up having a relationship with God. To me, it doesn't make sense because we should always be trying to understand and find meaning in our lives. But it also, it just seems it's a loss. It's a loss for us and it's a loss for the Jewish people. So, you know, and this thing about the, the chosen people, and then we'll talk about why does Hashem allow these horrible things to happen in the world? First of all, the chosen people is that we chose to take the covenant, much harder road. It's not that we're better, is that we took on a greater responsibility for the world. You know, we are the one religion where we are told you do not proselytize. Why? Not because we're better. I think the best way to explain it is I had uh, the last company I was working for, I had two guys working there. One, I made the mistake of saying he was a Marine. He made very clear. Once a Marine, always Marine. The other was a Navy guy, right? And my friend that was a Marine would always give the guy who was Navy a hard time, right? They always do that. But then I asked him, the guy that was a Marine, I said, why didn't you just go out and proselytize and convert all the people in the Navy to become Marines if Marines are better? Same with the Air Force. It's like, well, that wouldn't make any sense because we never could have done our job if it wasn't for the Navy and the Air Force. That's the idea of the Jew and the non-Jew. We need each other. The whole idea of when Mashiach comes, if Christianity had not been there, and when Mashiach does come, nobody would know what in the world's going on. It wouldn't be 15 million people that would have brought this idea of Mashiach to the world and God revealed it. It was the Christians. We couldn't have done that. So that's why we don't proselytize. We just have a different set rule. We're like, we have a different role in Hashem's creation. That's one. So we, we do take on greater responsibility, which means he's more exacting with us, which we have seen throughout history. We have fringe benefits, we have rewards, but we also, he's, he's tougher on us. We're the eldest brother. You guys set an example, okay? We're, we're the world that we're going to get the harder punishment. As far as why does Hashem let horrible things happen in the world, let's, it really comes down to why did Hashem give man free will? That's what happened. He gave us free will. And then men choose to use that free will to do horrible, horrible things. So that's really where it comes back to. Why did he give us free will? And, and the reason is because he, he in the heavenly realm, he already has angels that are well aware that he is sustaining them at every moment. So they don't have a sense of independence. So they're, therefore, they don't have free will. Hashem says do X, they do X. He wants a relationship. It goes back uh, to what we were talking about yeah. at the beginning. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, you know, a lot of men today... So, this is so disgusting and sad, but I think I saw this on a news feed the other day. Majority of men are, are opting for robot girlfriends. Oh, my Lord. You know, like, that's not a relationship, my man. It's not a relationship. <laughs> a relationship is when the other person's free will says, I love you and I want to be with you. Okay? And that's what Hashem, he wanted a relationship with someone that could choose. I want to be in a relationship with you, Hashem. And that's why he had to institute free will, so we could make this choice. So Hashem doesn't do evil things. Men do evil things because he wanted to create this 6,000 years of creation. Again, guys, we are in the construction zone. We're in the middle of a construction site, right? It's a 6,000-year construction process that began when he first took our holy neshamas from the closest place in creation to God and infused it into a body that was the most physical and mundane thing in the world and infuse them together. At that point, he said, now I have a co-creator. Go out and you build this world and make it hospitable for me. That's an amazing, beautiful idea where he is giving us opportunity. I agree. So if we want to stop these evil things from happening in the world, let's connect them. Let's, as the Jewish people, the big eldest sibling, spread his Torah everywhere. And that will get people to stop doing these evil things. It's a great point because, I mean— how many crossroads were there, just to use the Holocaust as the most extreme example, how many opportunities were there for somebody to stand up and stop Hitler, which would have stopped the Holocaust, you know, but for whatever reasons, they didn't do that. And man had the chance to stop it and didn't do it. And you're right. If, if, if Torah teachings had, had, had been prevalent amongst people knowing right and wrong, standing up for right um, and fighting the wrong— Maybe man could have kept it from happening, but don't blame God because it happened. Man did it, and man didn't stop it. Right, exactly. And I think there's a bigger idea here, too, that because the Holocaust is something that could either really make people understand how much God loves the Jewish people or makes them understand like he doesn't care. The reality was is that 
when we assimilate into the outside world, which Hashem, like all these parses we've been reading for the last several months now, over and over again, once we say, we throw off the yoke Torah and say, we just want to be like everyone else, we assimilate. We've already established that at Mount Sinai, we have a central task to bring in and usher in and remove the veil between us and the heavens. The entire creation is dependent on us doing this job, being his co-creators. So when we say we don't want anything to do with it, we just want to assimilate into the world around us, then who is killing us? Ourselves. Because the Jewish neshamas, you know, the way they come into the world, if you look at during the time in Egypt, and you probably have heard about we were at the 49th level of defilement, what was the one thing we were doing? We, we sort of kept our dress and our names. What did that do? There's no mitzvah about, instead of naming your kid Steve, you name him Yokov, right? There's no mitzvah about that or dressing a certain way. What it did was it created a fence for us that kept us from having relations with the Egyptians. That's what kept us from the 50th level defilement. Because once we do that, then we cause the Jewish people, we stop the flow of Jewish neshamas into this world because now people are intermarrying with other people that are not part of the Jewish people. And so what does he have to do at that point? It's extraction, which means, you know, you look at basically all of us live day, I think most rabbis would agree with this. Those of us live day are neshamas that went through the Holocaust. He extracted us from that environment because we were sabotaging ourselves so he could then put us into the United States of America and around the globe so we would have an opportunity now to, to do our job. So the Torah speaks about it, cannot do this. I need you to remain true to the Torah and me and be a unique nation. And when you do that, I will protect you. But it's just a harsh truth, but really it's a responsibility. It's an amazing responsibility he's given us. And we're supposed to bring people closer to, to God, to bring non-Jews into believing in, in, one, in one God by watching how good we are to each other and how well we treat each other and how charitable we are and the good society that we build it's supposed to be a light until the nations. I see that as something that's, that, that's beautiful. It absolutely is beautiful. And I think it's just, this is a deep exile we're in. And we're in the exile of uh, Esau. What was Esau all about? He didn't want anything to do with spirituality. All he wanted was physicality. Hunting, 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 kid, pleasure, killing. Killing, raping, sex, what, right? Yeah. And from that came Rome. And in a world we're in now where it's all about physicality and we are, we have this responsibility to say, this is just, it's an illusion, you know, and yes, he's hard with us because it's essential we complete our mission. I think that the way maybe to wrap this up is that we can look back now at growing up with our parents. Now, the time, you know, when, when you're a kid, you're like, why is, why am I getting punished right now? You know, I was thinking the same thing. You say, you see two little kids playing and let's say put yourself in the parent perspective, right? You see two kids, your kid playing with another kid and your kid's being, he's not sharing the toy and he's being rude. What do you do? You take the Tonka truck away from him. The kid's like, what do you, what do you hate me for? <laughs> right? Because <laughs> the, the parent knows outside time that 20 years from now, the 20 year old version of your child is not going to care about the Tonka truck. It's going to care about whether it learned how to be compassionate and think about outside himself. Or as another example as a parent, You're boiling some hot water on the stove and your young toddler, you are telling him, don't you dare touch that, you'll be in so much trouble. What's the kid scared of? He's not scared of the boiling water that could scald him. He's scared of his parents' mean, stern voice, which the parent wants to make sure he stays safe, okay? So child becomes older, you look at those parents, it's like, wow, my parents really loved me in those moments. I would just encourage anyone who, instead of saying, Tor is not true, I mean, because quite frankly, guys, if Torah was written by men, then those men lied and said it came from God. So we really don't want our origin story. We really don't want our origin story to be Judaism started with a bunch of liars, okay? Be open-minded to it, approach it with humility, learn, ask questions. Just experience it. You know, get, get, you know just, just to go to a Torah observant shul and experience it and learn from it. And it doesn't mean that you have to follow all 613 commandments. Uh, Lord knows I'm, I'm not there yet in my journey and I, I never will be, but just give it a chance because it's a beautiful religion with a beautiful message with beautiful people and everyone should at least give it a shot. Thank you, David. I'm so glad you came out here. We had such a great time hosting you here. We hope you'll do it again. Maybe after listening to this podcast, maybe some people in your community will say, well, we'd like to come. We'll, we'll accommodate you. 
Well, you know, my goal is to have the, the Torah Outreach Center of Huntsville. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's why our torch is here, to connect Jews with their Judaism. And then, of course, a non-judgmental way, which is the Torah and, and that deep connection to their creator. Amen. All right. Thank you, David. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking Donate in the top right corner of the page. And if you would like to get in contact with our host with comments, suggestions for future topics of learning, or questions for him or his guest rabbis, you may email him at president at torchweb.org.